This is lecture three of Haridas Chaudhuri's book, Being Evolution Immortality. Here we will cover chapters 11 to 16. The earlier edition of this book was called The Philosophy of Integralism, and in that text, these were the last chapters. In Being Evolution and Immortality, there are two additional chapters, and with some uh, time, I will conclude uh, those chapters at a later date. For now, we will consider chapters 11 to 16. So far, in the two lectures pertaining to this book, I have looked at the two first terms of the title, that is being and evolution. And if we go back to see how Haridas Chaudhuri deals with these ideas, we see that they are linked. And in fact, all three terms and some more terms are linked to form a single exposition of the philosophy of integralism, as Chaudhuri calls it and as Sri Aurobindo uh, has given uh, in his writings. So we find that being and evolution that have been covered earlier uh, start with positing an absolute being. This absolute being, which is Haridas Chaudhuri calls the ground of all existence, has to be indeterminable. That is something radically infinite, that is the subject, one may say, that cannot be described. At the same time, to become cosmos, it has to lend itself to be determined. It is a, a self-determination by which it becomes cosmos. And this viewing of itself as a being uh, that becomes is uh, what uh, Chaudhuri, following Sri Aurobindo, calls supermind. The supermind is this omnidimensional and integral ground of being, uh, which in fact becomes split by cosmic mind into separates. So these infinite multiple self descriptions of the radically infinite ground of the absolute become separate, separated in a kind of a cosmic uh, ontology that may be called the ontology of separation. This is really the ontology that we experience, which has been given to us by cosmic mind that follows the laws of logic and therefore has this uh, separate discrete realities into which it splits uh, the omnidimensional experience of supermind. So this is how uh, Haridas Chaudhuri introduces us to being. And if you think about being in the, these terms, we see how some of the categories that become separates are coherent and inhere in supermind. One of these primary categories are eternity and time. So we can view reality in a static manner, as an absolute static uh, system of possibilities or of uh, realities. At the same time, we can view these as emergences in time. And these may also be called being and becoming. Being and becoming become separated. We experience life in the cosmos in time, within time. And hence, we have an experience that privileges becoming. At the same time, we can experience a kind of transcendence of that, a coming out of that, uh, rising to a point of prospection of the flow of time, which may be called being. Now, these are experienced as separates by us, but in supermind, they would be experienced as related and coexisting dimensions of existence. They are both equally supermind's self-appearances. And due to the systematicity of supermind, this 
idea of becoming is has grades of emergence. There's a grades of consciousness that are emerging in time. It is not a haphazard emergence, but what we experience as becoming has got a kind of systematicity to it in terms of grades of, of consciousness. Now, here is where we come to with regard to what we've considered so far. Now, the questions that arise out of that are firstly a question with regard to, is this becoming something which is determined? Is it deterministic? Or is there some kind of creative participation that is bringing forth this, this, uh, these emergences uh, in, that we are calling evolution? And we can see if we look at uh, Western philosophy or any philosophy, we see that these become possibilities of explanation. Uh, one of the things that Chaudhary does not consider, for example, is how Hegel talks about these emergences as determined. Uh, actually, he does talk about it when he's dealing with evolution. Uh, later philosophers, for example, Nietzsche challenges that because he holds to the fact that the individual is completely obliterated, is not given fundamental status of reality. So if we consider this question, this question of is becoming something that is determined from outside or is becoming a kind of unfoldment of a process that is participatory in which the individual is an uh, important participatory uh, um, element, then we have to consider the individual, the philosophy of the individual, or as Chaudhary calls it, the principle of individuality. So what is the individual and how do we understand the principle of individuality? Chaudhary splits up this consideration into two kinds of views. Uh, he actually starts with the view of pluralism but I will invert his consideration because the view of monism is actually chronologically earlier than the view of pluralism. Uh, the view of pluralism naturally is that there are innumerable individuals that are independent. Each one has got unique independence and in that sense is absolute. There is nothing else determining the individual and the individuals take part in unfolding a becoming. On the other hand, the notion of monism is going to say that there is a single being and that whatever we experience in terms of separate individuals is either an illusion or is conditioned by that single being. So these are the two ways in which we can look at the principle of individuality. Uh, I will start with the, the second of his considerations, which is that of monism. And Chaudhuri talks about that in terms of modal or adjectival realities. So by modal or adjectival realities, he means we've actually come across this word adject adjectival before. He means there is one being or one absolute existence and that has infinite qualities and some of these qualities, some combinations of these qualities are individuals. So these individuals that form uh, partial uh, combinations of the infinite qualities of the one become, as it were, descriptors or qualifiers of the one. Each one is a qualifier of the one and they constitute the spread of the infinite uh, individuals that uh, make up that parts of the one. So this is a kind of a predicated or adjectival theory of the one. Where Chaudhuri had introduced this earlier was when he was talking about Vedanta and uh, developing the notion of integral non-dualism and the qualified non-dualism 
uh, of Vishisht Advaita is where he brought in this notion of a being that has infinite qualities and that is in relation to uh, specific combinations of qualities that are adjectival to it. These are the individuals. So the Vishisht Advaita, which he doesn't actually bring up when he's talking about monism, would be one of the ways of talking about individuality which is subordinate to a absolute monism. Uh, the modal theory is what he actually begins with and for the modal theory he takes us to Spinoza. So Spinoza who is a 17th century philosopher talked about reality as being one infinite substance. And this one infinite substance becomes everything else by affecting itself. The self-affection of the one substance are its modes. So the individuals, each individual is a self-affection of the one substance and so it is really the one substance seeing itself as a individual. The, the substance or substance also has two attributes. One is the attribute of thought or consciousness and the other is the attribute of, uh, of, uh, 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 of extension, which we may say is its physical or material existence. So individuals as modes will also ex exist in these two parallel modes of thinking and physical existence. And these two modes constitute uh, the individual. They are not separated as in Descartes, but they are parallel realities of the same. So they are modes of substance that are simultaneous existences of um, something which thinks and something which has a uh, existence in space and time as a body. So according to this view also there is no separate individual standpoint but the sense of individuality is arising due to isolated standpoints of sensuous imagination. So everything is subordinate to the infinite substance as modes of substance there is no independent will, no free will to the individuals that can be actually thought of as having a reality by itself. Now Choudhury goes on to talk about Bradley, uh, another philosopher and then a more recent philosopher Bosanquet and Choudhury says Bosanquet actually gives us a, a much more uh, sort of well thought out uh, theory of individuality based on monism. According to Bosanquet, uh, to quote Chaudhary, the absolute lays hold of external nature by and through finite selves, just as the mind of a great dramatist lays hold of certain portions of the external through characters of his drama. So here again we find a kind of subordinate reality. The characters as it were are completely conditioned by the dramatist and don't have a reality of their own. Uh, similarly he goes on to talk about mysticism and spirituality in these terms. Firstly there is the notion of what's called the via negativa. So via negativa or negative theology is a way by which we look for a transcendent. We take whatever we experience and we see if there is something more essential than whatever constitutes the differences of our experience. And we all end up with something this, that is indescribable. We have gone back to the absolute as it were that we started with but in doing so we have negated, this is an exclusive absolute, we have negated the individuality as a reality in itself. Uh, so too we find in Advaita Vedanta and in Buddhism 
In Advaita Vedanta, we find that this statement of the Upanishad that the self or Atman is the same as Brahman or conscious reality, absolute reality, is taken as a starting point that our individual deep self is a self-presentation of the absolute. But if we go back, we'll find that that particular um, self-presentation is kept in place by Maya so as to allow us to exist in the world. So there's a going back to the primary identification of self and uh, reality, conscious reality, Brahman, and then a negation of self to come to conscious reality. So self is really a self-presentation and subordinate in their view and ultimately illusory because held in place by a illusion-making faculty which is called Maya. Now similarly in Buddhism the self is a product of transience. In other words according to Buddhism our memory gives us our sense of self and memory itself is a a, you, we can think about Bergson's view of a cinematographic reality, that there are finite, discrete moments of experience that are close enough to each other to give us the impression of a continuity, and the self that we are creating is that sense of continuity. If we get rid of transience, we get rid of individuality as well. So Chaudhuri is going to sum these views up uh, to quote him by saying, individuality is an eternally cancelled unreality and selfhood is an eternally accomplished absolute. This is his view on these kinds of uh, individualities. Now from this, Chaudhuri is going to assert, if individuality is an unreality, then our life in the world must be void of ultimate significance. So here he is, of course, referring to by our life in the void world, our life in the world must be void of ultimate significance. He's taking a kind of an existential stance and he's trying to point to the fact that every individual has a sense of meaning. And this sense of meaning must be based in the reality of a meaningful world and the reality of an individual. So if this individual or this individuality is ultimately unreal, if it is really a figment of some other uh, transcendent being, then our notion of the world and our notion of self is ultimately having no significance. Uh, now, this view, of course, as I said, he arrives at later, but he starts with the notion of pluralism. The notion of pluralism is one in which the being as a overriding category is either negated or is made subsidiary. And this is actually much more normal to our ontology of the present. And that is because if we look at modernity, modernity starts with this kind of a view, the, the negation of the notion of a God uh, brings us to a notion of a world of infinite individuals. Now, the early idea of the Enlightenment is something that gives a certain place to God, but also a place that is not something that has any direct influence on the world. This is the philosophy of deism. Deism believes that God has given independence to the world. and God is transcendent and as it were enjoys the world or views it um, and according to different people with different degrees of participation. Ultimately no participation but for some there is some degree of participation. Now 
one of the thinkers of uh, the early uh, 17th century uh, enlightenment is Leibniz. Leibniz is a very important enlightenment philosopher and I actually came to pluralism and the discussion of Leibniz because Leibniz is working in the wake of Spinoza. And many people feel that Leibniz is given, giving a pluralistic view to the philosophy of Spinoza. Spinoza's individuals are monads and are modes or self-affectations of substance. In the case of Leibniz, he tries to overcome this sense of the subordination of the individual by talking of individuals as independent spiritual atoms. They are exclusive particulars. Each individual is an exclusive. So we have a plural world of individuals and each individual pursues its independent line of action uninfluenced by external agency. He says that souls are windowless. So this kind of windowless independence of the individual, of course, it brings up the whole new notion of how then are we to make a world together? Is it only through random relationality or is this something backgrounding it? Now, Chaudhuri actually does not fully explain the theory of Leibniz. It's quite complex. And, but a really important aspect of it is the fact that these plural particulars, these souls or monads, uh, they all have uh, each other. I mean, each monad is made up of all the others or they, it reflects or contains all the others. It, it's aware of the whole cosmos and all the other monads within itself. So there's an internal resonance or internal knowledge of all the uh, plurality. That's how he tries to bridge this notion of monism and pluralism. At the same time, we find that these uh, individuals, as it were, uh, don't have full uh, knowledge to, of what of harmony, of how they can build a world that is coherent. So here we find that uh, the, the deism action of the divine, the de deist action of the divine uh, works to give us worlds that Leibniz calls compossible. In other words, they, they have coherence. They are possible together, com meaning together, there is the possibility of operating together. This is the best of all worlds in a situation where we have independent individuals. Uh, another thinker that uh, uh, Haridas Chaudhuri brings up in the same mode, the same kind of idea is Howison, H-O-W-I-S-O-N. Individualism in for Howison also is qualified by a ideal harmony from above. Okay. Then um, Chaudhuri goes on to talk about another modern or rather somebody from his time, modern in his time, that's the early 20th century philosopher MacTaggart. We've come across his name earlier as well. So MacTaggart, Bosanquet, these are thinkers we don't talk about much today, but they belong to the early 20th, first half of the 20th century and are significant philosophers. So MacTaggart feels that individual selves are primary parts of the universe. They exist in harmonious association with each other. So there is a kind of a the fact that, that they know themselves to be parts of the universe. There's one universe and each one is a primary part of the universe. So there is a harmonious association with each other. They form an interrelated members of an organic or super organic system. Uh, and so unity, according to Chaudhuri in the system, is sustained by love and perfect understanding. So, so on the one hand, because we can find, we can see that here there is these ideas. I mean, actually, even if you think about Spinoza and Leibniz, 
they are much more complex than uh, Chaudhary's description, and that's the reason why there's been so much writing about these philosophers. And even modern or contemporary philosophers like Gilles Deleuze have taken up people like Spinoza and Leibniz and seen their complexity and tried to derive a philosophy that actually in some ways comes close to Sri Aurobindo in terms of being absolute as well as uh, part of the, of, of the one. Uh, how can something be independent, absolute, and at the same time, uh, that which is cosmic and has uh, all others within it. And that that kind of an idea is what both in the case of um, Spinoza and Leibniz, uh, Gilles Deleuze tries to uh, tries to investigate, examine, or even to some extent show us what needs to change. For example, in the case of Spinoza, if we take the modes and make substance revolve around the modes, modes become primary, then we find that it is, it, it, it's a different way. There we have independence of individuals and at the same time we find that individuals are drawing on something which is uh, what he uses the term univocal. The, the the one being that speaks as every other individual. You have, you have a connection of the two. Similarly, we find that with MacTaggart, we, we find that individuals have both these elements. There's one part which is eternal and one part which is becoming in time. He calls them subspecie temporis, becoming in time and is progressive and moves towards ideal perfection. And the other aspect is, is subspecie eternititis, which is the eternal aspect, which is already in possession of eternal perfection. So it's, a, it's an evolution in time that's taking place. In some ways, moving towards the idea of being and becoming as a single reality, the one uh, supramental reality, though he doesn't use it in that way. So Chaudhuri then goes to Indian philosophy and talks about multiple or plural individuals in the philosophy known as Sankhya. So we find the individual in Sankhya is split into two. A witness that is static and eternal, known as Purusha, and a mind-life-body complex that is unique and acting in the world that is known as Prakriti. According to Sankhya, there are many Purushas, and that, that is because there is one Prakriti. In other words, there's a single nature, and Every individual is a certain combination of the forces of nature with a, a, a witnessing consciousness within. And each of these witnessing consciousnesses can realize its independence from the mind-life-body complex. And when it does that, it becomes free. So if that's the case, then every individual has a separate witnessing consciousness of Purusha uh, and we can talk about many Purushas and one Prakriti. Now this idea of Sankhya has been adapted by other schools in India as well such as Vedanta that we've spoken of, the Bhagavad Gita and Kashmir Shaivism. They have questioned this idea of many Purushas uh, by saying that we don't need many Purushas. The, there is one Purusha who in association with different combinations of Prakriti produce different experiencing modes. These experiencing modes are what we are in the world. There is only one real experiencer, universal experiencer, but according to the many combinations of nature that it experiences, we have uh, differences of experience. 
uh, and this is the experiencing modes which are properties of nature that we may call ahamkara or ego. We have multiple egos that are qualitatively different, but the witness is the same. Now, Chaudhuri then sums up from both these considerations of monistic and pluralistic theories of individuality that individuality is neither an unreal appearance nor a self-subsistent entity. So both these views are exclusives and you can see how exclusives are the property of a mind begotten universe. So these exclusives are our entrapment in the cosmic mind, in the ontology of mind, and the ontology of separation of the mind. Now, to counterpose this idea, Chaudhuri uh, starts the next chapter, which he calls the integral view of the individual. And here he will look at uh, Sri Aurobindo's view, and uh, we can consider even before we get into his arguments, what is the nature of this view? The nature of this view is that the supermind or a, a absolute consciousness, absolute uh, being, a conscious being that wishes to come into the cosmos can operate on itself and become multiple a multiple self concentration multiple self uh, observations all at once it's radically infinite ways of viewing itself can become active now these radically infinite ways of viewing itself are uh, points of self concentration as it were these points of exclusive self concentration form uh, individualities. So it is the whole that is also radically infinite points of self exploration, observation, and therefore individuality. Infinite individuals are nothing other than the one absolute. So this is a way of talking about something that is supramental. The mind cannot grasp it because the mind separates. The mind wants to look at it either on one side or the other or privileging one particular uh, viewpoint over the other. So integral view of the individual, Chaudhuri, when he considers it, first brings us into our own experience. And he says that we have to recognize that there's a difference between the individual and the exclusive particular. The exclusive particular, which is this mental exclusion of our individuality as we experience it in the world. Each of us experiences our physical boundedness, our separation from others. And we also experience our mental and ontological separateness from others. This is what makes us particulars, but exclusive particulars. In other words, it's a separative sense of self. This is the ego. But we have another kind of individual, which is what I was talking about, which is the one that is observing itself as each one of us. And so that is not exclusive. That's a simultaneity of self-knowledge. That is the true self. The ego is a construct of prakriti or maya. So there Sri Aurobindo is bringing in this notion that we just considered of either Sankhya where we have nature and these uh, combinations of mind, life and body. We talked there about how the Gita, Kashmir Shaivism consider self as a experiencing mode of nature which we can call the ego or ahamkara. So that's the exclusive particular, uh, a construct of prakriti. In Advaita Vedanta, when we are talking about 
Maya as holding up the individuality, that's the individuality that Maya is holding up. In case of uh, the true self, which is within, uh, Chaudhuri, to quote him, says, individuality is a real and significant center of the self-expression of being, self-representation of being in infinitely diverse forms, agency by which ever new values are created. So here he's talking about what we just discussed, that the, there is a, a centering of the infinity of being in each individual as a point of self-expression and a point of self-exploration. This self-knowledge is also a self-expression as well as a self-creation. So new values are created from each of these self-explorations. What Chaudhuri does not talk about in this description is the ultimate cause for, is it just for self-exploration? Is it just for self-creation? Uh, why then have this multiplicity? Uh, even more fundamental than these is relationality. Relationality is why this, the one becomes many and enters into multiple relations to enjoy the one bliss of being as the bliss of love and relationality. So Chaudhuri continues to look more closely at the exclusive particular that we talked about and the true self and shows that these give us two views of the world. One is a egocentric view, which is what we normally experience. We are separate. We actually experience the world through our nature, which is made up of a, a, a apparatus of experience, phenomenological experience. These phenomena of the world are experienced through our phenomenological apparatus of sensing, thinking, etc. that Kant does such a wonderful job of in his critique of pure reason. Uh, that is the egocentric perspective on the world. But the true self within gives us a cosmocentric perspective, which as he said, that individuality is a real and significant center of the self-expression of being. So when we come to the knowledge of the fact that what we are calling ourselves is really a, a construct, a construct of nature, um, and if we get can liquidate that, uh, what Chaudhuri says is what is liquidated on the attainment of spiritual liberation is the egocentric individuality of an individual. So this is one aspect that becomes liquidated. Uh, many schools take that to be the complete li uh, liquidation. After that, they don't want to discover whether there is any individuality left. But Chaudhuri continues to say, to quote him, when a person discovers his ultimate ground of existence, his authentic individuality emerges. He begins to feel a spiritual kinship with the entire universe. He experiences a sense of responsibility for the entire living creation. His heart beats in unison with the all of existence. His soul is aflame with the spirit of dedication to cosmic welfare. In fine, he becomes cosmocentric. He understands how uniqueness and universality, I-ness and thou-ness, are inextricably interwoven in the concrete texture of his being." Unquote. So this is how we move to discover the truth of our individuality. And Chaudhuri says that in this true view, we can find that the multiple realities 
are all present at the same time. Uh, this individuality is one both of freedom and self-existence. It's, it's free, it exists by itself, and at the same time it is the transcendent being that because it's free and that is in union with all other beings. It is the same as all other beings in essence. So Chaudhuri talks about three properties of this individual self as uniqueness, which is really the way in which the multiple self-concentration of the being, each one of them is a unique point of self-prospection in which, as it were, the infinite qualities of the being are exploring themselves in a unique way. There is a certain configuration that is appearing and that in that sense, there is a freedom within the self to respond to its uh, circumstances and explore itself, bringing these powers into existence. That's uniqueness. The, the second property is relatedness. And the third property is transcendence. So these all coexist and are realities of the true individual. Uh, then he talks about the self-integration of these as something that is intrinsic to the individual that is moving from its present condition to its true condition. We can here talk about MacTaggart's idea of subspecies temporis and subspecies eternitis. Uh, moving towards the self-integration in a supramental view. Uh, the two great properties that uh, Chaudhary highlights in this process are love and creativity. He says, love universalizes individuality and creativity intensifies individuality. Both of these are transcendent at their root. Now, after this discussion of individuality, Chaudhuri moves to the consideration of immortality. And this is the third term in the title, as you saw. And when we discussed evolution, uh, we discussed immortality. Uh, we spoke of the fact that uh, even when we talk about Darwinian evolution, there is the notion of survival. And if we think about it in terms of consciousness also, we can see how each grade of consciousness that emerges in evolution is one that gives us more conscious ability to survive. And so individuality, when we are talking about the participatory individuality in evolution, there is an instinct within individuality to survive. There is an instinct for what uh, Chaudhuri calls the longing for immortality. This is not just at the human level, it's at every level. And so we find that it is expressed in various ways. Uh, and Chaudhuri starts by giving us the consciousness view of this expression. What is, what is at stake here? in terms of the human being and its conscious understanding, its conscious longing for immortality, when he will then go back to talk about uh, more elemental forms of the longing for immortality. At the level of the human, uh, the conscious way in which this instinct for immortality is uh, expressing itself, according to Chaudhuri, is to quote him, by gaining insight into the mystery of time, he is lifted out of the perishing moments of time. We are in the flow of time and we are subject to the movement of time, subject to time as death. Time inexorably leads us to death, but time also is death because this subjection to time makes us lose our sense of self from moment to moment. 
we die to ourselves at every moment, as it were. We are just swept on by the tide of time. So there is a drive to emerge from subjection to time as death. This is a more existential and ontological understanding of the longing for immortality. This idea, gaining insight into the mystery of time, he is lifted out of the perishing moments of time, is also a philosophical question that many have asked. Uh, there is a famous book uh, by Marcel Proust, In Search of Lost Time. Uh, and this is given a lot of importance by the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, um, who writes a book about this, in fact. Uh, and that is uh, along the same lines. How can we redeem the loss of time, redeem the subjugation of the self in the flow of time, the death of the self in the flow of time by finding something that brings us into the contact with eternity within time. Now, going to more simple and elemental forms of this longing for immortality. Choudhury says that this is seen at very primitive levels, firstly in the form of the immortality of the species. Nature itself is working there. The individual dies, but we reproduce and survive so that the species survives. Even Darwinian evolution is a form of that, that not only do species survive, species mutate to survive better. Uh, then we have, at the human level, we have more conscious forms of the same kind of thirst for immortality. We have the notion of a race memory, for example, history, or a family tree. A family carries memories of those who belong to the past and write those memories down, both pass it down orally as well as in written form, so that we have a, a, a survival, an immortality from the past that moves on. Uh, then there are more social forms of immortality as, for example, people who leave a name in a larger sense than just those who remember that person. That lasts longer. And this could be by buying a name for oneself. You know, this is economic, where you um, do something so that your name is, is remembered, a monument is built, or something like that, um, with, the, with your name on it. Uh, or it could be political. Uh, political imperial imagination is an imagination that wants to stamp itself on both space and time. And finally, it could be cultural. We leave cultural products around and the authorship of that product, product often is marked, bringing us a kind of immortality. Then Choudhury talks about idealistic immortality. And here he's saying, by idealistic, he means when we are lifted to the non-temporal. We are coming back to that notion of gaining insight into the mystery of time. There are moments when we are lifted into the non-temporal. We see some transcendent art, and it's as if we are lifted into the non-temporal. Nature, we go somewhere to a beautiful place of nature. We see these with... with the English Romantic poets, where the notion of nature becomes, as it were, a occasion to touch the eternal. Uh, Chaudhary also talks about extraordinary activity, creative activity, for example, the creation of art, the creation of science. Science brings us insights that are universal and hence make us feel as if we have come into contact with something internal. Mathematics brings us into contact with these vast ideas that um, give us meaning to uh, large tracts of reality. 
Then Chaudhary goes on to speak about personal immortality. Now this personal immortality again can sometimes be physical, physical immortality. And the notion of physical immortality is very ancient. We've seen how mummification happened and also the idea of resurrection, etc. These are ideas of physical immortality. At the spiritual level, we have the notion of reincarnation or transmigration. That is that even though the body dies, something within us continues and is reborn. Now, for Chaudhuri, we see that this kind of a persistence of the soul can be in another zone, not on earth, uh, after death, can be in a kind of heaven where it can be either static or dynamic. By static is meant that it's just eternal. By dynamic is meant that there is some kind of progress that takes place even outside of this life in the spiritual part of our being, uh, the soul or the reincarnating part. Um, Chaudhuri invokes Vaishnavism, for example, that talks about fulfillment outside of this domain of death-haunted uh, material life. So the soul persists, and if it has prepared itself properly, it enters into a permanent zone where it can know immortality either by living in the so-called world of God, Salukya, uh, or by becoming in the nature of God. In other words, it creates an immortal nature for itself, which is called Sarupya, or a kind of law of becoming, which is eternal, which is that of God, which is Sadharmya, uh, and etc. These are different forms of uh, likeness of a eternal and immortal image that allows us to persist in some uh, perfect world forever. We find this also in Buddhism with the pure lands, for example, the Western pure land. Chaudhuri moves on to talk about immortality as the essence of the spirit. And he starts this uh, chapter by talking about democratic immortality. That is, here on earth, instead of looking for some kind of a persistence in heaven, is there a eventuality when all human beings will become immortal? And he's talking about Mahayana Buddhism, for example, where there is the notion that all human beings one day will become enlightened. Whether they'll become immortal, it's not physical immortality, but a spiritual kind of um, existence beyond time. Uh, again, he doesn't mention Radha Krishnan, but Radha Krishnan is an Indian philo modern philosopher whose view of Vedanta is of this kind, that all of humanity is moving to a point where everybody will become liberated and become eternal. See? But Chaudhuri contests these views by saying, the eternal can be realized at any moment in time. It is not so much a eventuality, but it has to be attempted at any time. The eternal can be realized at any moment in time. So what is it that in, in us gives us a contact with that? Uh, these experiences we've discussed, but these experiences are sporadic experiences. There is something in us that is eternal, and that, again, is the true individual. And uh, Chaudhuri is going to point to that as the reincarnating center in us. It moves from life to life. Uh, this reincarnating self is called the psychic being by Sri Aurobindo. Now, normally, this reincarnating self is something that forgets after every life the circumstances that it has lived, and returns, as it were, in a new life as if it never experienced anything before, unless there is some way by which we open the doors of its own experience. But 
if by yoga we try to come into contact with that particular part, we may know continuity in consciousness. We find something in ourselves which is eternal, which has lived before and will live before, and even in our passage into other lives, we carry that stream of continuity. This is the experience of a temporal eternity. Now, similarly, we find that there's the possibility of rising to a transcendence that we've already talked about in Advaita Vedanta, for example, the consciousness rises to a transcendence. And we can try to experience the two as one, the temporal and the eternal. And we go back now to the starting point of what we were saying with regard to um, evolution, being evolution and immortality, that the eternal and the temporal, being and becoming, are to be known at once. Even in ourselves, they are to be known at once. So this is the message of the Upanishads, particularly of the Isha Upanishad, which Sri Aurobindo translates and comments on. And to know that is one way by which we can find a supramental status of the eternal. So Chaudhuri talks about four aspects of this kind of eternal. This, this status we talked about is a status in consciousness. It does not matter if I retain this body or not, this nature or not. Even from life to life, there is an eternity. And outside of all lives, there is an eternity. And the two are one. But there is a way by which we can bring that eternity into our everyday life and into this body. And that is what Chaudhuri, following Sri Aurobindo, is going to talk about as the four aspects of immortality. The first of them is the individual discovery of a non-temporal dimension. This is what we are seeing. The, both of these are non-temporal dimensions in time and outside time. Either one of them is an individual discovery of a non-temporal di dimension if we can live in that, we experience a liberation in life known as Jivan Mukti. The second aspect is the conscious unity with the infinite without loss of personal existence, becoming cosmocentric. So here it is not merely an individual discovery, but our knowledge of the individual being a part of the whole, the eternal, the eternal and the temporal. So there we are united with the infinite without loss of personal existence, becoming cosmocentric. Uh, Chaudhuri uses the Sanskrit term Sarvatma Bhava. Uh, Bhava. Then the third aspect is the intelligent participation in the creative advance of life. So not only is this experience at the level of existence, but it is also a creative aspect of the evolutionary unfolding of life in which I participate as a form of uh, becoming that is eternal. And that creative uh, participation, evolutionary participation, he calls sadharmya mukti. The dharma is the law of becoming, sadharmya mukti. And the fourth aspect, he says, is the harmonization of the personality and the transformation of the physical organism, which he calls rupantar mukti. Now, harmonization of the personality and transformation of the physical organism means to bring this power of individual eternity into the nature, the mind, life, body aspects of the nature and make them all resonate to that power of eternity so that they themselves become, as it were, eternal. Ultimately, uh, a supramental body, according to Sri Aurobindo, is one that is immortal. 
And that kind of immortality is a culmination at the physical level. It is not like searching for physical immortality either by some kind of medical means or by some kind of occult means as through mummification, but as a consequence of the experience in consciousness of eternity. That eternity is translated into the nature bodies and becomes both mental, vital, and physical immortality. Now, that in a way gives us a well-rounded understanding of the title of Chaudhary's book, Being, Evolution, and Immortality. But even in this earlier edition, Philosophy of Integralism, Chaudhary continues to consider one other important issue that is uh, philosophically debated and that has its own solution in the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. This is the problem of evil that is known in philosophical terms as theodicy. So, Chaudhuri first presents the problem. He presents it in terms of Hume, but Sri Aurobindo himself has presented that problem in a very succinct form. He says, a God who tolerates suffer suffering and evil is either impotent or perverse. This is Hume's argument and Sri Aurobindo's statement of it. A God who tolerates suffering and evil either doesn't have the power to overcome it, is impotent, or has the power but willfully or willingly uh, subjects the world to evil and suffering. So is perverse. Now, we have to ask the question, what is evil? Uh, Chaudhuri gets to that later, uh, and so we'll do that as we go on. Uh, but what, he's, what, what we can talk about right in the beginning in terms of how we understood evolution is that if evolution is a kind of process in which uh, that which is fully conscious loses itself in a in conscience, then this self-loss is attained through a will to forget. And this will to forget uh, retains itself. It gives it an independence just, uh, just because of the function of mind. As we said, mind highlights every feature as an independent reality. So whatever enters into a mind-controlled cosmos is given its independence. And so we see that the will to uh, to to involution, the will to self-forgetfulness is operative as an independent principle in the world. This is the foundation of evil because there has to be a pressure against that to overcome that. At every stage, there's a struggle against that. That is given ontological independent right of existence in the cosmos. Anyway, that we can come to later and see how uh, that uh, ties up with uh, the rest of the theories that Chaudhary is going to consider. He starts by talking about Plato, who says that evil and suffering emerge because of our subjection to matter. Matter is a form of non-being. Uh, as we know, Plato talks about the two worlds, the ideal and the empirical, and uh, the ideal world is perfect. It is ruled by the perfect ideas, and the empirical world is something that emerges in matter, which is a form of non-being, and hence contains the negation of the powers of the ideal. So because of that subjection, we experience evil and suffering. Now, this kind of an idea uh, gives ontological reality to the material world. And this, like a 
ontological reality that is permanent. There is no change. There is no evolution here. And this also is the view of most of the Indian spiritual schools. There is no evolution there. There is two permanent zones. One is the zone that is perfect. The other is the zone that is fallen. And in this fallen zone, everything is subject to suffering and evil because there is a forgetting. Just as we were talking about, there's a forgetting. But there's no pressure against that forgetting as a whole, a cosmic pressure to return or become again uh, the fullness of the conscious being. Now, Chaudhuri then goes on to talk about Zoroaster and Zoroastrianism, which asserts an eternal duality of good and evil. Uh, there is another philosopher uh, or school, Manishi, Mani, Manishism, uh, which is also considered to have the same kind of dualism at work. The Veda also often talk about the battles between the Devas and Asuras. It goes into uh, the Puranas as well. Uh, so this battle between the Devas and Asuras is supposed to be independent relative realities. Uh, neither is given uh, priority over the other. Now, there is a transcendent that has become both of them in these schools of Veda and Puranas. So there we find that there is something that can, in a way, um, enter into or intervene in this equation. But uh, in Zoroaster, we find this eternal duality of good and evil. Uh, then he comes to modern philosophers like William James, who points to the fact that evil is a rock on which all forms of monism are wrecked. In other words, uh, you know, there is a existence of evil. If there is a one, it doesn't seem to hold up. There is an existence of evil in the world. And so, uh, according to James, the world is a plural world, as we were considering the different philosophies. The world is a plural world in which evil coexists with an ideal tendency in the nature of things. So, there is a question of choice. There are these potentia and we can choose uh, in the an ideal tendency in the nature of things. There is no absolute in this world. Uh, Chaudhuri continues to talk about theism, by which he means uh, religions, particularly here, uh, religions that have a God uh, that can be, that explain the existence of evil in terms of a devil. Uh, it's like the good and evil, like the devas and asuras, but here there is the individual and its choice. So a root individual that makes a wrong choice, a choice of against God, uh, creates an entire reality that is, you know, saturated by that sense of evil. For example, <clears throat> the disobedience of God, bringing about the original sin. Their evil is a perversity of will. Evil acts uh, through a perversity of will. There is a choice, but by making the perverse choice, we open up the doors of evil. Now, Chaudhuri goes on to talk about pantheism. And this is a, a common view, even in our times, uh, which is that there is actually no evil. There is only ignorance. In other words, what we call evil, firstly, it's relative. Uh, for some people, what is evil is good for others. And on the other hand, if there is the overcoming of ignorance, that which we thought, thought was evil will not happen. So evil is an appearance which will melt away upon the emergence of a comprehensive view. Here again, there's a subspecies eternitatis, so eternal uh, 
few which is backgrounding reality which will emerge one day and automatically evil will go away. This is like the view, I would say, analog analogous to the view of gas expanding in a vessel. That there, that there is something there that automatically expands. There is no pressure against it. Today there is no knowledge, today there is ignorance, but automatically we become more and more knowledgeable. The more knowledgeable we become, the less ignorance there is and the less evil and suffering there will be. So there is no ontological evil here. And so evil is unreal. And in a way, Chaudhuri critiques this view by saying, as a result, passive submission to evil is also okay, because that it, all we have to do is work towards uh, the over eradication of evil, of, of ignorance rather than evil. But if we look at it from the viewpoint of a involution in which there is a will to forget, a will against consciousness that begins the process, and that doesn't go away. It is not a gas that's expanding. We can see that very clearly in the fact that there is a tremendous struggle for the emergence of consciousness all the way down to matter itself and the emergence of life and matter. It's a precarious process that is contested by nature or within nature itself that shows us the action of a will against which we must exert um, a power uh, towards consciousness. So uh, that kind of a pantheistic notion is also carried in Advaita Vedanta, non-dualism, where uh, ignorance or evil is considered to be just a illusion and individual uh, transcendence of that is enough. Chaudhuri comments that there is no perversity of will or Satan. The root cause of evil is nescience. Nescience is in conscience is the, the eradication of consciousness. And that's what we were talking about. It's not merely nescience. It's the will to nescience. That's why evil is not just ignorance, but it is a consciousness that keeps uh, reality in a tight deadlock of not emerging into uh, the fullness of consciousness. Uh, Chaudhuri ends his consideration uh, by uh, through the chapter called Evil, Suffering and Growth. There he takes these views that are there with many people who try to make sense of the of the suffering in the world. Here he's looking at evil, you may say, is the circumstance and suffering is the response. So from the viewpoint of subjective response, uh, one of the views is suffering is a necessity for growth. Many people think that, you know, adversity is our greatest uh, you know, teacher. Suffering is necessary for growth. And Chaudhuri says that's like making a virtue of necessity. Uh, suffering is ne not something that we should uh, hold up as a virtue. See? Uh, we, we are faced with suffering. We are faced with a will against consciousness. We struggle against it and we do grow from that. That does not mean we accept that as a eternal condition and for the reason of growth it has been given. Uh, he does not consider another view, but a, a similar view can be uh, considered by us and that is the notion of suffering as the result of karma. Uh, many people who believe in karma today uh, in India for sure and in most uh, Asian countries, but certainly across the world now, people who have accepted the notion of karma feel that it is a theory of retribution or a theory of um, 
mechanistic consequence. If you do good, good comes to you. If you do evil, evil comes to you. And it can come to you in other lives. And so something, suffering that happens to you, you can justify it by saying, I did something wrong in my previous life. And it's worse when you justify suffering others of others by saying they did something wrong in their past life and justify it like that. Uh, that is a wrong view uh, because in a way karma does not work like that. Karma is really about evolution. Karma is about the fact that if we take certain actions, we build a momentum towards a greater consciousness or against consciousness. Again, these wills that we're talking about act in our lives and we carry it from life to life, not necessarily a, a orientation which is retributive. Uh, then he considers the argument that suffering is an unavoidable condition of life on earth. So here there are people who feel that because we did something wrong, we were born on earth. There are many Puranic stories like this, uh, great gods, etc., who did some mistake, uh, have to take a number of lives on earth to endure suffering. In other words, it's kind of like a hell and hell experience. And this also, Chaudhary uh, does not endorse this view. Then there's the notion that we thought of earlier about ignorance. There's no evil, just ignorance itself brings about suffering. And from this point of view, since ignorance is intrinsic to our condition, there's nothing to be done. As we said, uh, we accept ignorance. Some views uh, are that the way to deal with suffering in a world that is ignorant is to look at our experience impersonally. So here, in fact, there is some truth to that. And uh, Chaudhary uh, discusses that in terms of an aesthetic theory of experience. For example, if we go to a play and we see somebody suffering, acting out their suffering, or we some, see somebody acting out their um, oppressive character or acting out some kind of reprehensible action, if it's done in an aesthetic manner, which is extremely effective, uh, we feel a kind of joy in that. So the idea is that if we can, in fact, uh, impersonalize ourselves and actually look at life and our own experience in an impersonal way, we'll see it like a play of moods. The, everything is a play of some kind of rasa or mood and that we can experience the emotion. Even if it is suffering, it's a emotion that some part of us can be free of and can experience it as a type of affect, uh, which is a kind of bliss. Uh, so this, it seems a little outlandish, but this is part of a conversion of all experiences to bliss. However, this kind of approach cannot uh, override the notion that suffering is not just a result of ignorance, but as we discussed earlier, a result of the will against consciousness, which is actual evil. Um, Chaudhary says that growing spiritual insight into the essential structure of self and the supreme purpose of life is necessary to deal with suffering. Uh, to quote him, he says, it also implies an intelligent and constructive channeling of unconscious drives and urges toward the creative fulfillment of one's authentic self. With the increasing elimination of primal ignorance from life and society, evil can be more and more
conquered. Conquest of evil is an essential prerequisite to the kingdom of heaven on earth. The kingdom of heaven on earth is a heuristic maxim for actualizing man's profoundest potential here and now in this very world. It is the outflowering of the divine in human society. It is the eventual triumph of light and love over darkness and hatred, of knowledge and freedom over ignorance and bondage, of justice and peace over barbarism and war." Unquote. Here we can see that suffering and evil are not something to wish away. It is something in which we participate. We we struggle against, we bring out our own powers, uh, we bring out the power of consciousness, we experience everything as a form of bliss, but not bliss in reception, but bliss in action. We are activists that actually need to be able to grapple with the forces of the world and see them as they are from a transcendent view but at the same time, from the viewpoint of participating in a greater evolution in which evil is obliterated or dissolved in the appearance of a fullness of knowledge.